begin by welcoming Professor Jacob Rosen to the stage. Professor Rosen specializes in medical robotics and has, I've never quite seen this before, three joint appointments at UCLA in the schools of mechanical engineering, surgery, and bioengineering. So please welcome Professor Rosen. Thank you. Uh, these appointments are nothing related to me. It's just to represent the fact of the spectrum of things um, that robotics or medical robotics is trying to cover. So uh, I will cover um, surgical robotics in this talk, and my next talk at two will cover uh, rehabilitation robotics, um, although the title is pretty generic. This is not a growth rate of a successful um, tech company. That is the growth rate of us, the most successful species um, that evolved on the face of Earth. And if you look carefully, you'll see the black flag that eradicate about 30 to 50% of uh, Europe. And you see how small of a dip it is in our growth. So we are, as today, uh, 7.6 billion people on the face of the Earth. And this was um, generated through uh, three revolutions, the cognitive revolution, the agricultural revolution, and most recently, the um, industrial revolution. So people may think that uh, Ford, Henry Ford, invented the car, but he didn't invent the car. What he invented is the assembly line. And the assembly line, in some respect, is a blue collar revolution. What we are experiencing right now is the white collar revolution. So what um, the industrial revolution introduced is automation. Medicine is going through the same revolution that industry um, was going through pretty much because there are not enough surgeons and physicians to serve 7.6 billion people. So how this revolution is uh, going through. There is um, a, a significant uh, reason why surgeons would like to, rep to replace the most dexterous manipulator ever created, which are the 10 fingers, with tools that looks like that and replace the vision, which is another significant sense, with cameras that look like that. These are endoscopic cameras, and get views that looks like that. What these two transitions are allow the, allowing them to, to have a tremendous dexterity and very high quality vision, and enable automation in place like the operating room that they were ne never um, had before. So I want to classify the field for you. I assume that um, not all of you are uh, intimately familiar with uh, surgery through a table. Eventually, it will emerge to a table, but I will describe you the two dimensions of the table. So the first dimension is the level of uh, invasiveness. And so in the old days, uh, they used to say the greater the surgeon, the larger the incision. And so you can see these large incisions typically in uh, heart surgery and hip surgery, they are 30 centimeters long. And all the surgeon cared about is exposure. That's what they care. And through public demand, and uh, these inc incisions are getting smaller and smaller. Everyone wants to have a scar tissue be below the bikini line. And these techniques called minimal invasive surgery evolved. And through these techniques, technique, uh, small incisions are made. If the incision is smaller than two, mi two millimeter long, you don't even need to stitch it. It will heal all by itself. So in you start to insert tools into the abdomen and operate under the skin with the camera. So that's sort of in the next level of invasiveness. The second, or the following one, is why should we make multiple uh, holes? We can make one, and through this, the, the same one, we can insert all the tools that we need and all the cameras. Um, this is called notes. Catheters is another example of, of how we uh, invade the body through uh, our 
uh, veins and arteries, we can depose uh, medications or stents in, in them. Needles is yet another level. This is a, a, an example of how uh, radioactive seeds are inserted into, into the prostate. And the last one is we don't invade uh, the body, or at least physically at all, and we can uh, use radiation as a, as a way to treat, um, in this case, cancer. So that was sort of the vertical axis. The horizontal axis is um, how, how we control these devices. The common practice is what is known as a master-slave, meaning there is a robotic system over here, and then there is a, a surgical console, and the surgeon is sitting in front of it, and every motion that the surgeon will generate will uh, translate into the ro robotic system, and this is how um, surgery is performed. This is the Da Vinci by Intuitive Surgical. Most of the male in the crowd will probably lie under this machine and the prostate will be removed. So if you will go to a urologist that will tell you, I'll do it with my hands, walk away. Because uh, if you care about your erection and your ability to control uh, urination, then you should be using this machine. If the only thing you'll remember from this talk is that, <laughs> that is my price. The other end of the spectrum is machines that are completely autonomous. This is a machine where uh, another a male problem uh, can implant hair autonomously. So uh, once the hair was removed from so some parts of the skull, usually the back of the skull, then the, mach the machine will in insert this the uh, 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 hair into the, into the head uh, completely autonomously. So this is sort of representing the other spectrum of the scale. In between, there are machines that are controlled by a human, but the robot and the human surgeon are holding the tool together. So typically, you know, this is a machine to perform a knee surgery, and what the robot would provide is uh, virtual fixtures, it's called. These are planes in which the surgeon is not supposed to penetrate. So they can uh, move around, do whatever they think to uh, need to remove, but they are not allowed to uh, move below a certain level. And uh, this is another example of, oh, let's just keep that for the sake of time. So it, I took all the existing systems, both in industry and in um, academia and plot them on these two-dimensional graphs. So you, what you can see, there is a very, there are many systems over here that are human controlled um, and relatively large uh, invasion. There are v almost none over here and there are a few over here. So it's sort of uh, representing a map of opportunity of where the whole system is or the whole field is moving. I'll show you my contribution to the field, and this is a, a result of a, a very bad relationship with industry. Um, the reason why this system was developed is because uh, Intuitive Surgical didn't uh, allow us to get access to their own system. So doing research in surgical robotics without a platform, it's useless. So we developed this, um, this system, it's a minimal invasive uh, approach, you see the tools are inserted into the body, you see the, the inside uh, to these uh, ports, and the surgeons can operate under the screen. Um, once sur uh, surgical robotics invaded into the field, um, the entire dynamics in the operating room have changed, and the, the typical dynamics is a collaborative effort. Surgeons, uh, being a very strong alpha males, don't like collaboration. The only reason why they collaborate is because that's the only option that they can do that. And so, uh, in developing Raven, we, we try to bring back this uh, type of collaboration, so we develop four arms that will substitute, essentially, two surgeons in the operating room. And many of the research efforts was uh, to design them in such a way that they will not collide with each other. And what you can see here, the cones, the gray cones over there, 
these are the workspaces of the arms, and we design them such that they can have the largest common workspace in which both surgeons with both hands or arms can reach uh, the surgical site. This is uh, an overview of what Raven was going through uh, through many years. Uh, the first site that is typic you typically take your uh, creation is uh, an animal lab. Uh, pigs are using as uh, good animal models for uh, performing um, both training and testing with, with robotics. The reason is because their organs are about the same as human organs, despite their smaller size. This is an example of um, what is known in the military extreme environment. If you get funded by, by the DOD, they take you to, to the field. And what was demonstrated here, the surgeon is sitting in one tent and the robot is in a different tent. And the link is done to a UAV, you'll see it in a second, and that is essentially um, a hub uh, that is flying in, in the sky, so the signal is bouncing from the tent of the surgeon to the surgical robot, and the image um, of the surgical site is bouncing back to um, the surgeon. The next environment is extreme as well. It will show up in a second. And NASA is having um, a facility in the uh, Key Largo. And this is facility is an underwater facility to train uh, astronauts for long um, human missions in space. One of the surgeons here was working with NASA for many years. It is likely that uh, uh, deep space missions of NASA uh, will include a surgical robot that will have some um, intelligence built into it such that this system can treat patients in uh, missions where it may take uh, uh, years to go back. So this is the facility. It's in Key Largo underwater. We took the robot uh, there too. And it was teleoperated from Seattle to Key Largo. Um, a distance like that uh, introduce um, time delays. Time delays is the, the, uh, the drawback of a long distance teleoperation, and therefore automation is probably the only solution to uh, these time delays. You'll see that the surgeon will perform a task um, moving blocks. And this blocks is not um, a toy task. It's a task that surgeons are using to train um, the residents. And in this particular case, this is emulating uh, tissue manipulation. This is done under about um, one uh, second time delay. If the delay is less than a quarter of a second, they won't even know that there is a delay. But as you introduce more and more delay into the system, uh, you'll see that their performance is degraded, although they will never admit that. And uh, they will start admitting it after one second of time delay, or they will just throw the tools and say, we can not even do that anymore. So that's sort of the nature of surgery and the nature of surgeons. Um, the other part of the system is a surgical cockpit, and this is where the surgeon is typically using, uh, sitting. Um, and using, we have developed a new uh, concept of a surgical cockpit. Uh, what is unique to this is we, we add more elements to it. This is a, a set of paddles that are haptically enabled, meaning um, the, each, each paddle has an actuator. These are the, the three fingers. We introduce a, a third finger into the system. And the idea is that you want to convey a lot of information to the surgeon because the surgeon is like a conductor. They control everything in the operating room, not just the, um, the surgery itself. In the interest of time, I will um, jump further. Um, there is no technological barrier to conduct a teleoperation. This is an experiment that was done across the globe with different sites, with different systems, uh, both master and slave, demonstrating that teleoperation is possible if this is what we want to do. 
Um, this is an example of um, collaborative surgery. So in this case, you'll see, um, I don't know why it's not playing, but um, this Two surgeons were sitting in uh, about 1,400 kilometers away from that machine, and they collaboratively uh, performed the task in, in which each one of them is using um, a, a pair of these two arms. Automation in surgery. Uh, it's likely that one of the pair of these arms will be controlled by an algorithm. And so the question is what, how we do that. This is an example of a, a surgical task. Again, it's a video. I don't know why it's not playing. But um, what is done in this task is this uh, pink uh, elements was removed completely autonomously. And when I say autonomously, I didn't mean that uh, uh, the trajectories are, are designed uh, or pre-designed. You can move it around, change the orientation, the only uh, command that the algorithm would, would get is remove this um, pink part away from the yellow part. That's all. Everything is flexible. And this is the level in which AI right now is, uh, have reached as far as manipulation. Um, this is another video that will show you uh, the difference between a human operator and autonomous system. So on the left, the, it is a completely autonomous system performing the same task as a human um, would do. Uh, the task again seems very simple, uh, but it's representing in surgery uh, tissue manipulation. So on, the, on this part of the screen, you can see what the camera would look at. And um, you can see that the automation was completed, and the human is still working on it. Uh, one of the things we discovered is that an algorithm is, is moving in a straight lines, which is obviously the, the shortest um, connection between two points. And the human is moving in arches, uh, afraid, afraid to uh, knock these uh, blocks. I guess I'm behind. I want to show you one more video that will represent the um, automation in the operating room. So this is an operating room that there is only one uh, individual in this room, and this is the patient. It was funded by DARPA, as you may know, the agency that um, created the internet. They used to look 20 years into the future. Now they are looking in five years into the future, because the future is as they say now. There are two functions in the operating room, um, which nurses are typically uh, providing. Um, one of them is the stern nurse that is providing uh, supplies to the surgical robot or the surgeon, and, or cha changing tools. You see that the nurse or the function of the nurse was uh, replaced by an arm. These, two, these arms here on the left are uh, the da Vinci, and these are human controlled. So all the rest are completely autonomous. The surgeon will say sponges. This arm will go to this um, uh, equipment dispenser and provide sponges. The surgeon will say scissors. The nails will go to a tool changer, um, in in interact with the surgical robot, replace a tool. It will do it in half of the time as a human would do. Although it may look uh, slow to you, a woman, a, um, a human can replace a tool in 20 seconds. This is done in less than 10. So what you can see here is that there are, again, no barriers in introducing automation into the service part of the operating room, as well as the operating itself. That will be it. Thank you.